I wasn't strictly truthful in my last video when I stated that what I had drawn is a Turing machine. It was actually an implementation of a Turing machine. For all intents and purposes, it operates identically. But I must make a point. Turing machines are concepts, and everyday computers are an implementation of that idea. Turing machines provide a way to describe computability. In other words, they measure the ability of a computer to solve problems. At the lowest level, we have the finite state machine. Remember, that's the one with the circles and lines from the last video. Its primary limitation is that it can only process fundamental algorithms. Giving it a stack creates a pushdown machine, meaning we can execute more complex logic, and adding a second stack makes a Turing machine, which means we can run even more complex programs. Under our current understanding of the universe, Turing machines are the absolute limit of computability power. There isn't another machine we can design to solve more problems, at least theoretically. So if Turing machines are concepts, but we can build implementations of them, an excellent question to ask is, how do we know what we've built is the equivalent of a Turing machine? Remember back to the last video. There are specific problems we know only Turing machines can solve. Last time I described pushdown machines or pushdown automata, such as regular expressions, and I said that they cannot recognize palindromes. Remember, a word like race car that is the same forwards and is the same backwards. Well, if we build a machine, give it a palindrome and see if it can recognize them in a general way, then we know that the machine that we've built is something outside the capability of a regular expression language. In other words, we've built an implementation of a Turing machine, at least in terms of the problems it can solve and the algorithms it can process. What I've described is the basic idea, but it's far more complex than I've made out. But I care more about the concepts and your understanding, so sorry mathematicians. Let's suppose you build a machine in your garden that solves a set of problems, which pushdown machines, such as regular expressions, cannot solve. Then you have created a device which is equivalent, at least in its problem-solving capabilities, to that of our theoretically described Turing machine. When a device is proven to have this equivalence, we say that it is Turing complete, because it is equivalent of a Turing machine. One of the most fascinating ideas of theoretical computer science is that all computers that are Turing complete are identical in some fundamental universal way. I personally like to say that the only difference between machines and processors isn't in their ability to complete tasks, but in their ability to do them quickly while using more or less power. A good example is an ARM processor in your mobile phone. It can load web browsers and watch YouTube videos and play Minecraft just as well as an Intel processor can, but it uses a hell of a lot less power than an i7 in your laptop. Interestingly, this idea of equivalence between processors and in turn assembly languages makes it possible to virtualize and emulate different machines, all from a single laptop or server. It's at this point we need to talk about assembly languages themselves, instruction set architectures and processors. To put it plainly, a computer processing unit or CPU is nothing more than an electronic finite state machine, albeit a very sophisticated one. The way we configure it with a set of instructions, or rules, is called an instruction set architecture. For example, we all have a basic understanding of arithmetic operations, like adding two numbers together, multiplying them, or subtracting them from one another. These instructions also exist within assembly languages. Let's say I wanted to add two numbers together, then subtract one from that result, before then multiplying it by three. All I have to do is write a program with the relevant instructions listed in a precise order. Remember, the only thing a processor knows how to do is read instructions from the beginning of a program, perform some action, such as moving data or calculate a value, then read the next instruction and repeat the steps I've just mentioned. Here's the example written down as I've mentioned earlier but drawn on my paper. We want to add 
3 and 4 together. So we use the add instructions and say 3 and 4 to indicate we want to add these numbers together. The result that gets returned is 7. The processor finishes and moves on to the next instruction. The next instruction is sub 1 from that result. Therefore, we take 7 minus 1 to get 6 and then move on to the next instruction because we finished executing. The next instruction multiplies it by 3. Because the result is 6 and we multiply it by 3, we get the result 18. We then attempt to move on to the next instruction, but there isn't one, so the processor stops or halts. In this instance, these words add, sub and mul, addition, subtraction and multiply are known as mnemonics. They are orders that tell the processor what to do, whose only job is to read one of these instructions, process it and move on to the next one. When you write software in Python, JavaScript or C++, this is literally what your code translates into at a processor low level. Importantly, I also demonstrated how the program starts by reading the first instruction and how it ends by reading the last instruction and halting when there's nothing left to execute. Most people don't realize that your processor is always trying to finish. The only job it has is to eat instructions until it turns off again. Ideally, your laptop, phone or server wants to turn on, run for a few minutes and then stop forever. There is nothing more complicated about Turing machines, quantum computers or cloud technology than moving something from A to B and sometimes performing a calculation. The entire set of these rules, mnemonics or instructions that a processor can recognise is called its instruction set architecture or ISA. Intel has its own collection, as does ARM, as does PowerPC. But nonetheless, they are all describing the same thing, a machine that you can feed instructions until it ends. However, not all programs end immediately, and computers are known to run for a very long time, sometimes requiring human input. That's because some of the instructions within the ISA are branching instructions such as loops. Operating systems are a classic example of multitasking that reads a program and continually jumps back into itself, waiting for further instructions. You can also control how it behaves by writing your own code, compiling it to the relative ISA, and then running it on your computer that understands the ISA. Remember, you write Intel instructions for Intel processors, ARM instructions that are understood by ARM processors, and PowerPC instructions that are understood by PowerPC processors. If there's one thing I want you to take away from this lesson, it's that programs, processors, and computers all want to start, eat instructions, and end as soon as possible. They begin, calculate, or move stuff around, go to the next instruction, and continue until they end. Sometimes they branch back into themselves in what we call loops. The name of this list of instructions that we supply to computers is known as software, programs, executables, binaries, interpreted code, and a myriad of other terminology. Next, I'm going to delve into the ideas of virtual memory, paging, and paging to disk.